I'll probably more of you haven't. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. So without further ado, oh by the way, Woody's going to go for about an hour. Um, and then we'll need to stop him. Have a break, because it is a long <laughs> have talk. Have a break. And, uh, and then he'll continue. Yeah. continue. That's okay. everyone. Okay? GM2F Vivi. Good evening, gentlemen. As Hugh has just said, um, a number of you here, I'm sure, this evening have heard my talk on numerous occasions. So I hope you'll bear with me and hear it for another time round and not be too put out with that. And for those of you who have never heard before, I trust that you also find my talk of interest and probably learn something about it and what had happened to a lot of us in Burma during the Second World War. This talk happened, uh, or the, what I'm going to, to tell you about happened such a long time ago, uh, I think I should only uh, be fair and use uh, two famous words when people are talking, and that is, say, once upon a time, because it is a long time ago, this, over 50 years, all this um, uh, happened. Uh, first, uh, first of all, I shall explain why I went to Burma and what I was uh, uh, doing there. I was uh, in the Royal Air Force during the Second World War, and I was trained on the um, ground technical side of radar, and I specialised in one type of radar, which is known as GCI, that is Ground Controlled Interception. So I'll fill you in on, on that just a, a little later on in the, um, the talk. So I was trained at RAF Cranwell, and after leaving Cranwell, like all the other uh, technical people, uh, we were all posted out to operational radar stations on the United Kingdom in what was known then as the home radar chain. And for those of you who are not familiar with the system, there were radar chains, uh, radar stations rather, dotted uh, all over the United Kingdom at vantage points uh, because of the possibility of air attack. So uh, I was duly uh, posted to uh, an operational GCI, but I'll just give you a quick rundown on what a uh, GCI really meant and what we were actually doing. Now, what I'm going to describe at the time was the leading edge of technology. It will be very old hat today, 50 years later, so I'm sure you'll understand what I'm talking about is not current technology. Uh, an, an average a, a GCI station in the United Kingdom, I, I'm at the moment talking about a fixed station, not a mobile, consisted of uh, a radar a aerial or antenna which could rotate, a, a receiver which had two cathode ray tubes, the one on the um, left hand side was a PPI tube which had a rotating time base, the centre of it being the centre of the aerial outside. And of course they were both slaved by a Selsen motor as the antenna turned round the same bearing was being followed by the PPI tube for passing plots. The other tube was what was known as the height range tube. It gave um, a height or a range, and the range was calibrated from zero out to whatever range one was working on. And at the start of the uh, trace, at zero on the height range tube, we had the ground ray from the big uh, radar transmitter, which was pulsing. Now, to give you an example of the power we were running even then, it was running, it was pulsed at a megawatt. So that's a million watts. That just gives you an idea of the power. But as I say, it wasn't a key down conditions, it was a being pulsed. So what actually happened was this on a GCI. We were always tied in with a fighter squadron, and we, we had over and above the fighter squadron to deal with, we had a twin channel VHF unit which went with us, wherever we were moving, uh, uh, they, they would go. But on fixed stations, the fixed uh, 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 VHF channel was, was also fixed. It didn't move. So the reason for the twin channel uh, VHF was this. As we were tied in with the fighter squadron, what really happened was the fighter squadron aircraft were all locked on a, a certain frequency by crystal control. And our VHF channel was the same. In other words, whenever the fighters were airborne, immediately we were in contact with them, and we had, sitting between the two radar operators, a fighter controller. He was usually a commissioned officer, and he had a microphone, a head and breast set, and he spoke on a landline, he fired up the VHF equipment, and he spoke directly to the pilot once he was airborne. In other words, we had full control over that pilot. He had to accept our instructions from the ground. In other words, if someone said, take the following bearing, he would do that and uh, you would hear him getting instructions probably about his height. They might say, uh, I think we'll have to lift his height a bit. You'd hear them saying, go to Angel's 10, which was 10,000 feet. He would start lifting and we'd see this coming up on the height range. He was following the commands of the uh, controller. So once action started and there were various uh, 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 aircraft uh, 
uh, up there, one had to be sure you were looking for hostels, not your own people, you see. So you had to be very careful because at the beginning we didn't have what was known as IFF, that was identification friend or foe. But again, I'll explain a little bit, bit, bit about that later on because it came late on uh, in, in the, the, the war. But uh, as things were uh, progressing, uh, a good fighter controller could control a number of aircraft at the one time. As long as he kept his eye on the PPI tube and he could see the, 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 the plots coming up uh, or the echoes moving about, if he was a good man at the job, he could really put uh, our fighters onto a target, you see, very quickly. So that's what we were uh, uh, actually doing. And of course, uh, the system in the UK was fed from the, the national grid. But we had a 20 kV Lister diesel in a diesel house at readiness and it had an automatic start if the power went down on the grid or were bombed the diesel fired up and we were back on, on the air. So, so that was what uh, I was doing when I went to an operational radar station in the UK. The only difference with a mobile is the same equipment, it's in a series of vehicles in a convoy, rather large, uh, sort of cumbersome looking vehicles, there were Crosleys, very, very uh, reliable, and of course th that, that was it. So once, uh, uh, once uh, I um, uh, realised I was posted uh, overseas and I had a uh, had all my training and had experience in an operational unit, I realised I might well be posted overseas. And of course, it happens to so many of us. You all keep saying, I'm going to dodge the boat. I'll never get caught. You know, I'm on a cushy number here. It'll never happen to me. Well, it happened to me. And I was unfortunate because two other people were due to go in my place and they both failed the medical. I was the only one that passed the medical. So I was the chosen one. I had to go. Well. I duly reported to this PDC, that's the Personnel Dispersal Centre in England, and I was told just to hang about, go down in the morning to the order room, see if any mail was in or any orders. Well, I was going down there one day, and uh, I met two other RAF uh, uh, personnel going down for the same thing, to look for mail or to see if there's any orders about a draft. And one of them was carrying a small RAF bag with a strap, and I accidentally bumped into it. It was just, oh, Watch it. What? I said, what's wrong? He says, I've got my two-valve shortwave set in there. I said, you shouldn't have any radio here. That's illegal. He said, I'm a radio man. Oh, I said, you are. I said, so am I. And the other fellow, he was only a BRS, but a very interesting fellow, you see. So the three of us walked down to the orderly room. We duly checked up and there was nothing doing. But on the way back, we started to talk. And we realised we'd probably go out on the same draft together. So this is the, the, the setup uh, as it worked out. We all agreed it would be a good idea maybe to exchange home addresses. And when we got out to wherever we're going, we probably wouldn't get home uh, quickly at the end of the war, assuming we survived the war. But we'd maybe be able to come on the air by amateur radio. So this was the thing which was for a, a, a front in our mind. We had all this worked out by the way, you see. We're not even on the boat, you see. So we were duly told we were going to Liverpool, to the docks at Liverpool. The ship was there, the, the, the RAF a troop ship. And when we got there, it was a Furnace-Withy liner known as the Queen of Bermuda, made by Furnace-Withy in Belfast. It had been made in the 30s, and it was a luxury liner which had been used for sailing uh, rich Americans to the Caribbean islands. So it was a, a pretty posh uh, vessel we were going on. But it had been uh, radically changed because 4,000 of us were on that ship. Just to give you an idea, and as I say, it was 22,000 tons. So away we go, and I'll, I'll not uh, dwell too much on the voyage. It, it was sort of uneventful. Uh, one of the, the interesting things was we would be about uh, two weeks out, and a notice appeared on the notice board, and some fellow said uh, they were going to call an RSGB meeting on the ship. And I thought, what's this? They discovered there's a number of amateurs on the uh, the, 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 the ship, you see. So we all congregated at this time and we started to have RSG meetings. We had little lectures and this and that and it became very, very interesting, you see. So as time went on, we realised that it, we were probably going into a warmer uh, climate and by this time we were just starting to run into the Indian Ocean. And of course, we were in a enemy territory, there were Japanese submarines about everything, and quite often, for certain times in the day, we were depth charging off the stern of the ship. And I don't know if you've ever been on a, a ship when they're firing depth charges off the stern, they have a catapult and they launch them. They just look like great big 40 gallon oil drums, and when they explode, it gives you enough time to get the ship away eh, from the explosion. I mean, it's just unbelievable the way the sea goes. And of course, if you're watching the wake of the ship when you're sailing, it's not a straight line, it's like this. In convoy, you're zigzagging all the time, so if there's anyone trying to track you, they're having a difficulty. So it took us 31 days at sea, without stopping to, to sail anywhere, to get to Bombay. Now, the reason we went into Bombay, 
Bombay has a big a transit camp known as Worley, W-O-R-L-I. That's the place where all RAF personnel in the Second World War, entering what was known as the Southeast Asia Air Force, had to go. Everyone from the, the top man right down to the lowest uh, airman went through Worley and got you got your posting. So we duly got off the, the ship there and we were taken up to the, this place. And Worley, it was quite nice. I thoroughly enjoyed it in my time there. While I was waiting to uh, go uh, to wherever they were going to send me, I was swimming in the Indian Ocean. There was a lovely, uh, a lovely swimming pool down there uh, outside Bombay. I was in there every, every day. So it, it, was, it was a pretty cushy number I was on. But I realised it wouldn't last. And what actually happened was this. Of the two fellows I, I met, one was Bert Smith. He came from Hyde in Cheshire, and the other fellow, Leonard A. Flint, Len Flint, he came from Ipswich. And Bert Smith said he thought he had noticed someone pinning an order up on the notice board. So down we go, looking down the names, it was a, a orders for various postings. But Bert Smith suddenly said, I can't find my name. He got down near the board, oh, he said, I found it. I said, where are you posted to? He said, RAF Base Signals Depot, Bombay. I couldn't believe it. I says, man, you're posted to Glen Eagles Hotel. What a <laughs> posting. I said, that, it's just down the road. I says, home from home. Oh, he's rubbing his hands. You see, it was wonderful, you see. Leonard Flint, he's looking for his one, you see. Way down the next list. Found it. Posted to an RAFA radar signals place near Madras. Well, I thought, Leonard, you're doing all right, you see. But I couldn't find mine. Here I'm on another list, you see. And I see my name. And it just had on it. With immediate effect, posted to the Burma front. And I says, my goodness, I've really drawn the wrong straw here. I've had my lot, you see, but orders are, you must go. So we duly parted company, but again, we made sure we had uh, our home addresses so that we could keep in touch. So I was told to hang fire for a day or two, and uh, they would arrange a plane to fly me from the airport at Bombay. It's called Santa Cruz, by the way, the airport at Santa Cruz, all the way across India to Calcutta. They would uh, uh, drop me down there, we'd be down for about an hour, and uh, we'd get the aircraft checked out, fueled, and we'd have something to eat, and we'd proceed. And the airport we would land at, when I tell you the name of it, was Dum Dum. Now, mm -hmm. I'm sure a number of you have heard of Dum Dum, because this is where this famous bullet was first made. This terrible bullet, which is illegal today, and if it hits you, it's so soft, it just, well, it's a terrible thought. But this is where the, the bullet went. So the airport there was Dum Dum. This is the story they're giving. And I says, but what happens then? He says, we'll fly over the mountain range into the Imphal Valley. He says, that's as far as we can go because the Japanese are virtually surrounding the place. They couldn't get in by road. I said, okay. So um, I was there for maybe another two days and I got word from the order room uh, to um, uh, report uh, to um, the airfield. But I had to go back to the order, the the uh, the orderly room to check up if everything was alright, if, if I had any documentation to do or any to sign anything. They said no. And I happened to walk around the back of the, um, the orderly room and of course I realised that if I was going to have any hope of getting on the air, I had to be the biggest scrounger of all times, steal, rob, do anything to get bits and pieces. But Bert Smith was alright. He could go up to the local storeman in the, the place at Bombay and say, just give me two 807s and uh, I'll just take that ceramic capacitor. I couldn't do that, you see. He was made, you see. It was so easy for him. So I see something in a big pile of rubbish and it looked like a headset. So I um, pulled this thing out. Didn't look very good, but I said, that's the start, you see, for my junk box, you see. So away I go. So they said to me uh, in the, uh, the ordinary room, that uh, I was going to a, a unit called 885 AMES. Now I better explain what an AMES is. In the early days of radar in Britain, they did not give any form of radar station which they were working on a station name. For instance, say there was an RAF radar station at Alloa, it would normally be called uh, RAF Alloa, but because it was very experimental and so secret, they, they did not a, they, they did not a, say um, where it was, they just gave it a number and because it was experimental, usually a professor, believe it or not, was actually in charge of the whole setup. <coughs> the senior officer only had to answer for the RAF personnel there, but as times changed, they took away the RAF professor, he went back to his university to do more tweaking and fiddling about and the RAF it, uh, at this stage took over, but they still retained the old AMES system, the numbering for stations abroad, because they were mobile, they were always on the move, and of course, latterly, as the home chain grew in this country, they just gave it a station name. As I say, if they had a station at Alawa, it would be called Daria Falawa, or one in Bridge of Ireland, whatever, they, they just titled it that way, but they retained the AMES numbering for um, the, uh, 
the mobiles uh, abroad so that they could keep moving and the air ministry would know uh, where they, they were. So I duly reported to this airfield, to Santa Cruz uh, in Bombay, and the pilot came out to meet me and he explained, of course, what we were going to do. And he said, we'll, we'll have a final break at uh, Calcutta, at Dum Dum at the airport, and then we'll go over the top into the... Uh, into the battle area. So I said, fair enough. I mean, that, that was it. I, I was acting under orders. I just had to go. So the trip was uneventful across uh, 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 India to, to Calcutta, to the airport at Dum Dum. And they were down there for maybe about an hour and an hour and a half. We had something to eat and they uh, sort of stretched their legs. And when we were walking out to the aircraft to, to go the final bit, the pilot stopped me and he said, uh, just have a good look around here. He says, this is the last time you're going to see civilization for a long time. He'd already been in there, you see. Uh, he was a, a very experienced pilot. So I just thought, well, fair enough. I mean, I've, I've still got to go. So away we go, and everything was, was going fine. We lobbed down at um, the airport there at Dum Dum, had something to eat and a break. Out we came, the aircraft serviced, and away we go. Well, we'd been on our way for quite some time, and uh, the pilot suddenly said to me, you see the pile of blankets there? He says, get one blanket a big one, and wrap yourself up. I'm going to start to climb. There's no pressurizing in this aircraft. It's going to be cold. So I got this blanket, and I'm sitting there like an Indian squaw, you know, rolled up, you see, trying to keep myself warm. And we kept climbing and climbing. And I don't know what made me do this. We were well up. I mean, the aircraft was really like nosing up, you see. And it was flying the thing beautifully. And I looked out by sheer chance. It was a miracle. I looked out, and the starboard engine suddenly went on fire. Great big flames licking out the side of the cow. And I thought, my goodness. So I yelled up to the pilot, he had noticed it, and he just shut the engines off and the whole aircraft started to seesaw like this till he put it in trim. And I can see that, that propeller yet, that black blade, stuck like that, jammed, you see. And then he said to me, don't panic, he said, this aircraft has the capability to fly on one engine. I thought to myself, what, over a mountain range like this, you see? He says, yes. Well, we were nearly at the top, and he never said this to me, he must have taken a chance, and he switched the engine on again, he fired the top. And by sheer good luck, it seemed to be all right, there were no flames, so we just went. We right down, and we got down into the valley, into Imphal, and we landed at this great, great big airstrip called Tally Hall. It was one of the only air, airfields in uh, the Manipur state at Imphal which was still in our hands. The Japanese had everything, you see. They were right up there, you see. So I got down, and uh, a, a little 1,500-weight Bedford truck came out uh, to pick me up. They knew I was coming, you see, and I said, cheerio to the pilot. But I asked him, I said, have you any idea what to him actually happened to him? He says, I have flown in this route many times, and he says, I have many hours on this type of aircraft. I have no idea, but he says, I'm certainly going to get it checked before I take off, because I've got to take this airplane back to Bombay. So we parted company, and I thanked him and said goodbye. So they, they came, they took me up to the orderly room, and when I went in there, the, the, the fellow in the orderly room said, oh, you're the fellow that's come from Bombay. I said, yes. Well, he said, your unit is expecting you, because he said, we're really going to move now. And I, I said, can you give me the, the number of my unit? Yes, he said, you are posted to 885 AMES. This was a mobile GCI. So he started to tell me all about it. He says, you're very fortunate. He says, this unit you're going to, 50 men, that's the total strength from the commanding officer right down to the cook. That's all, one cook. That, that's the entire complement. He said, you are very fortunate. Every man on this unit is hand-picked. He said, it's a unit with a very fine record. So he said, you're going to a good bunch of chaps. Well, he was right, actually, at the end of the day. I mean, I didn't know this until I got to know everyone. So um, I said, but when do I, I move to pick them up? Well, he says, that's the problem. He says, the unit has been up the Dimapur Road in Assam for two and a half years. Operational up there. But he said, they've never moved the vehicles. They've all been in a, a convoy. So they've just been roughly servicing and blowing up the tyres. He says, they've never run a mile. He says, <laughs> we understand they've had breakdowns on the way down. And they're trying to come down this terrible road, you see. I said, so where are they hoping to hit in Burma? Because I got hold of a map. He said, they're heading for a place called Moniwa, but he said, it's going to take them some time, so we'll hold you back until we feel we're ready. So I had to fiddle about there at, at the Imphal for a bit, and as it as usual was, I meet people and speak to them, and they knew where I was going, they said, oh yes, that's a, a nice unit, they're telling me all about it. So I got word that they had got through into Burma somewhere. They weren't quite into Moniwa, but I was to be ready to go, and suddenly I got the word. They had a plane ready, and I would go. So I went down to this air, airfield, Tally Hall, and I, I think it was a, an Australian pilot I had this time, a, a very, another, another very, very good chap. So um, what actually happened was this. He said, I'm not going to fly all the way to Maniwa. There's a place before it called, um, uh, I thought it was Kaliwa, and I think I wrote it down, actually, uh, somewhere, uh, because I wasn't uh, too familiar. Yes. Kalemio, it's very near Kalemio. It says, I'll try and put the plane down at uh, 
uh, Calimio, and he said, we'll stop there for a short time and I'll make the final hop into um, a Maniwa if it's cleared of the Japanese, not to get into the, the airfield, you see. He says, because I have no armament in this plane and we have no parachutes. And I was bending us wrong. We're scuppered, you see. So um, we take off and uh, away we go. And we then came to this place, we circled round and I looked down and the airstrip was just a narrow cutting in the jungle, as if they'd cut it out just with a scythe, you know, and there were trees there about 100, 120 feet high. So he made a very nice landing. Now I'm not suggesting for one, one moment that the surface we were landing on was like London Heathrow or Gatwick, you know, but we got down, you see, on the grass and we taxied in. When we climbed out of the plane, I see this thing, four great big sticks in the ground and a hut on a flat platform with a thatched roof. We call that a basher, by the way. And there were two fellows there, that was the control tower, you see, and they're waving down to us, you see, like this, and we said, what then? So they asked where we were going, we told them, you see. So they said, hang on, and they told us where uh, we could get something to eat, you see. So we walked over, got something to eat, and uh, all was going well. Mm -hmm. And then the pilot said to me, he says, it's getting late on. He says, I think we'll stay here overnight. We'll make the final dash to Monua, and it'll probably give us more time to make sure it's clear there, you see. I said, okay, you're the boss, you're the pilot, you see. So we asked one of the, the permanent staff there, a few uh, RF people there, where would we sleep? Well, they said, you sleep anywhere here, you see. And as I turned round on the edge of the airstrip, there was a tiny little tent, we called them pop tents, to hold one man, that's all. It wasn't big enough for two men, one man, a pop tent. I said, could I maybe sleep in this? He said, certainly. He says, there was a fellow in here before you. It was his own personal possession, this tent. He walked away and left. He forgot about it. Use it, you see. So when night came, I get the head down in this tent, you see, and I had a very good sleep, I must admit. I never heard a sound. So in the morning, I go over to get some breakfast. Now, of course, it was very primitive, you see. And one fellow said to me, where did you sleep last night? I said, eh, on the airstrip. He says, whereabouts? I says, in the pup tent. And all the people who were saying they're good, I said, what is wrong, you see? He said, did you not know? I said, did I not know? What, what are you trying to tell me? Oh, he said, the Mad Major was out with his crew last night. I says, the Mad Major? And who's the Mad Major? He says, there's a Japanese Major and a sort of suicide squadron. They go around all the small units, like cutting up, blowing up aircraft, throwing hand grenades and everything. But he says, the army scared them off last night. And I says, where were in the airfield? He says, they were down at your tent. I says, you mean I was lying there sound asleep and they didn't know? He says, it's just as well you didn't snore. <laughs> Very sound, you see. So, up I get, have a brush and a shave, and the pilot says, we're ready to go. But there was one rather strange thing. I noticed the pilot was sort of doing a few paces about the end of the airfield. I thought, what's he up to here? So I said, what's, up, what's this, you see? And as I turned around, I looked at the end of the airstrip. I hadn't noticed this. There in the last lot of trees where they stopped the cutting like that was a big C-47 jammed in the top of the trees, just doing that, like a bird. I said, what happened here? He said, the pilot had a, a, an instant stall of both engines when he was just above the trees and the aircraft came down like that. He had no chance to glide <coughs> in or anywhere. And they all climbed down and the aircraft's been left there. But I said, just answer me one question. Is that the direction we are going out? He says, that is the problem. I thought, uh-oh, we're in for some trouble here. And then I looked and I says, well, I see the other problem. He says, well, you tell me what you think it is. I said, I think it's the big tail fin that you're worried about on the Dakota, because on the, the Dakota, the C-47, there's a great big steel uh, antenna on it too that goes down into a big bowl where it goes into the radio cabin. He says, that's it. He says, that few height, feet of height is going to be the danger height. So I says, what are we going to do? He says, we're, we're going to go. We're going to have a shot at it, you see. So the aircraft was pushed away back as far as we would, the tail into the jungle without doing any damage. And he said, we're going to get into the plane and I'm going to leave the engines running really warm for a long time, longer than normal, and we're going to storm down that little airfield and we're going to have a go. Well, this happened, you see, we're sitting and he gives me the old tin tack, you see, and we're away. Now, I'm going to be honest with you here, what happened in the next instant. I realised the aircraft was just off the ground. You know, you can tell, you see, even if you're sitting with your eyes shut, you know you're away, you see. And as it got more and more height, as I thought, you see, I thought, how am I going to help the pilot? And I got up off my seat and I'm going... <laughs> and of course my feet are on the ground on the, the, the main catwalk on the plane. I'm going like this, getting excited, you see. Luckily the pilot didn't see me because he was going up, you see. Well, I'm not joking. Just as I looked out at the starboard side, I could see the wingtip of this uh, uh, C-47. And that pilot took us straight through the middle of it. And I think we must have cleared that tail fin. But I, I asked him after, he said we only had a few feet of clearance. But he was very good. He circled round once to let us have a look at it. And the boys in the control tower were waving to us as much as cheerio, you know, we're off. So this was us on our way to this place, my destination, Maniwa. 
I duly arrived there, and uh, my unit was there. But what a mess it was in. I have never set eyes on a mobile GCI in such a state. It was terrible. It wasn't their fault. They'd been lying up this road and they'd been using it. The vehicles were, oh, they were, I thought they were ready for the scrap heap, you see. But they had managed to drive them down, even with all the breakdowns. And I said eh, a goodbye to the pilot and I thanked him very much. And as I was walking over to speak to someone to find out where my unit headquarters would be, because it was still old tents and old buildings and just a lot of rubbish, you see, a fellow walked out to the plane and I noticed he had Canada on here, you see. And he said, hello, he said, are you the fellow that's come to 885, you've flown in from Bombay? I said, yes, I said, I've actually come from Imphal. But he said, you started at Bombay, is that right at Warley? I said, that is correct, that's where I've come from. Well, he said, eh, I am going back to Canada. He says, I've just been repatriated, my tour of duty is up. And, it, and it, I remember he told me his name was McGuinness, and I shook hands with the fellow. I said, that's nice, thank you very much. He said, I'll be in Canada eh, fairly soon, and I'll get a long leave, because I've had no leave out here for oh, so many months or something. You see. And I, I wished him well. So I walked over, and I sort of booked in, and they, they told me where I, I, I could put my uh, uh, stuff down, all my kit. And uh, I happened to walk into the WT cabin, that's where all the radio was, because out there you have no telephones, everything is by radio. And uh, they were actually on the air, the, the, the wireless operators from my unit were on there, we had usually about four or five wireless ops, and they were never off the air, they were on, on shift, you see, all the time. And when I looked down, uh, there was a normal RAF key, and the fellow was using the RAF key, and he didn't know me, but he just said hello, and he kept uh, away. But when I looked alongside him, there was a, 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 a chrome Morsky screwed down and in parallel with the main uh, Morsky he was using. And he noticed me looking at this and I said, I'm interested in your Morsky. Oh, he said, yes. He, I said, I, I recognise the key. I said, it's an American Speedex made by E.F. Johnson. He says, how did you know? Well, I said, I'm a radio ham. He says, the fellow McGuinness is a radio ham. He left it with us. That was his key in Canada before the war. Oh, I said, I, I didn't know. I missed the fellow, you see. Anyway, we duly got to, uh, uh, started. And we had an awful job putting the, 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 the station together. They had lost parts of the aerial cabin inside, a thing called the phasing diamond, and it, it's a, a critical part of the whole equipment. And no one had any dimensions, so I said to one of the fellows, if you can give me the SDs, that's the secret documents which we had, I'll find the dimensions for this phasing. He says, that's one document we don't have. So I had worked on phasing diamonds for two or three months before I went out to the Far East, and I said, give me a big white piece of paper, and we laid it down. And I made rough measurements because we had a stub switching on various quarter wave transformers built in, and of course it was twisted at one bit to get the thing back into phase, so all the switching was right. And I said, we've got plenty of 12 gauge wire. That was the, the, the wire we used because we had an overhead run of about a, between two and 300 ohms feeding the transmitter and into the radar receiver, because it was all triggered, you see. So we tried experimentally, a, a few a sizes and got a big soldering on it, soldered it all up and uh, put it in and I could see the space where it had been so I knew I wasn't very far away. We got it in, I said, now the test is this, if the responses on the receiver are poor, we've had it, we're, we're wrong, our dimensions are out. Well luckily they came up pretty well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was like a, a brand new spec radio but it was, it was pretty good. So we got that over and we had to do some repairs on the top of the cabin but we got the whole thing uh, uh, running and of course there was a fighter squadron just arriving on this old airstrip it's next to where we were. And I should tell you, the, the CEO of the, the, the um, fighter squadron was one Group Captain D.O. Finlay. Now, for those of you who are in, interested in athletics a way back, D.O. Finlay was the gold medalist in hurdles in the Olympic Games for Britain in 1932 at Los Angeles. But he was a professional RAF officer and a professional fighter pilot. So he was the commanding officer. So we had to deal with him. So what actually happened was we got everything running and it were operational for quite some time and there was quite a bit of, of activity there. Luckily, we had no great trouble with the Japanese because the 14th Army were very strong around us and they had us more or less in a box in case anything went wrong. In other words, they were sort of looking after us. You see, that was part of their, their, their duties, you see. So we realised as the campaign uh, moved on, we'd probably have to dismantle and start moving. Here, one day I met another Canadian. I don't know if he was actually going home, but he had this old radio, an American chassis, uh, all the valves in it, and a speaker, but he had no cabinet. I said, what are you going to do with this? He said, I've got to get rid of it. I'll be going home eventually. I said, uh, would you prepare to sell it? He said, okay, we've got a deal. I said, ah, but how much? He said, 65 rupees. Well, we didn't call them rupees out there. We called them chips. He said, 65 chips. I says, you've got a deal. Because this was the next thing from a junk box, you see. I thought, oh, oh, make something of this here, collect bits, you see. So I gave him the money. Well, when I got back with this, one of the lads said, where did you get the radio? I said, I bought it from that Canadian. Gonna be. He said, if you don't mind me asking, how much did you give him for it? 65 chips. 
He says, the output tube in that here is worth more than 65 tubes. I says, as difficult as that? He says, yes, radio parts here are very, very expensive. You know, I've got a, a, a bargain. Anyway, we got word that um, we'd probably have to um, uh, move uh, on. And as I say, uh, the, the places are decided for us. We, we, we just uh, act under um, uh, orders. And uh, after uh, we left Emmanuel, we were told we'd have to head for um, McKillar. Now, McTiller was quite a long distance away, and it gave us time for the army to clear things out. But there, there, there was um, one a great a problem. When we looked at the map, we had to get across the Irrawaddy. Now, the Japanese were on the other side of the, the Irrawaddy, and this was a, a great problem. So, we got instructions to head a north and then proceed a, in a, an easterly direction. And uh, we would get a, a radio a message to tell us whether we're going to go to, to, to Mandalay with the 14th Army and storm it there, or we're going to go down south eventually to the capture of Rangoon. So this uh, was something we just had to, to wait and, and find out about it. And as time went on, uh, I should tell you, when we were on the move, at certain times of the day, we set up our radio and we listened for a coded message which would come in. And whenever the coded message came for my unit 885, it was all quiet. The message was copied by the wireless operator, and that was our instruction, you see. Well, we didn't quite know what, what was going to, going to um, uh, happen here, but we thought it might be uh, the north, but we weren't very happy about that, you see. We thought, oh no, this is, this is not so good, you see. So we're all sitting quiet, and we looked at our watches, and the the, the chief wireless officer said, well, I've got about 10 minutes to spare. He says, I'll tune my um, radio to BBC London. We'll hear some of the news or music or something till we wait, because we've got BBC London very well. So he, he, he quickly does this, you see, on the receiver, and we're listening to it all. See, and, a, and suddenly a voice said, we're now going to have a, a musical programme. We're going to have some bass baritone singing, you see. Uh, someone like Ian Wallace, you know, a very nice, rich voice, you see. And they said, and the first tune will be On the Road to Mandalay. <laughs> now, I'll not... I can hardly believe this. The men on my unit are standing at this road, and there's a crossroads, and this old sign said, Mandalay, so many miles. Tongu, Rangu, so many miles, you see. And they're all out, and they're at the Duke of York. They're all dancing to this music, and bowing and curtsying, you know. And, they, and there's a war on, you see. We're in the middle of this. It's not like, my goodness, what's up? It's this I've got lumbered with, you see. But there were a lot of characters. Anyway, we duly listened to the radio when it came up, and there it was. We were going to Mictilla and then south, but we had to cross the Chindwin, and this was the problem, because the Chindwin is a very wide, very deep, fast, I mean, big steamers go right up there almost to Mandalay from Rangoon, I mean, it's a massive a river. So, we thought, well, that's it, you see. So, on the way to um, this crossing where we were supposed to go to meet a, a big landing craft which would be, take, take us over, we had to cross various places, and there was one place on the map we looked at, and I remember this from something, it was called Mount Popa. And Mount Popa is the place where there's the greatest concentration of snakes in the world. In other words, if you go up there and then it goes wrong, you have had your chips. Really, you have. And I said, how do we get over there? He says, we're going up the side of Mount Popa with all the vehicles, the whole convoy, and down the other side, and then we'll head for this spot on the Irrawaddy because we had to go down to Mictilla. Well, we got all our, uh, you see, we're, we're stripped just in shorts, you see, and maybe an old bush hat and boots, but we all had to put on our KD slacks, you know, button up our bush shots, everything, tighten up your, your wrists and everything. And I had special snake boots, which I had, put the snake boots on, and you lash them so your, the legs are sort of covered if anything does go wrong. And it, we start to go up this, the side of this Mount Popa. Well, we'd be about halfway up, and one of our vehicles suddenly went like that and got stuck. We couldn't move down. We were frightened if we started up, it would just topple over the side. Well, by sheer luck, at the bottom of this um, road, we started to climb up. There was an, uh, an army staff sergeant, in the, I think it was in the Royal Engineers, and he came hurrying up. He said, have you got a problem? We showed it. Showed him it. He says, hang on. He went down and he bought a great big sort of caterpillar tractor thing, a massive thing. And he said, have you got any tow chains? And we had, of course. He put one round a tree and, went, and he very slowly backed this thing and he pulled their vehicle right on to the road again. 
And we thanked him, and away he went. Well, I'm not joking. We broke the speed limit to go over that road. Up there went, psh, away down the other side, as quick as we could, you see. Well, of course, we had the next uh, 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 hurdle to uh, get over. That was the crossing of the river. Well, we had one jeep on the, 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 on the convoy of vehicles. And, of course, as you know, an American jeep has a very flat radiator. And we used to use that... A, as our map table when we stopped. We'd lay a big map out, you see, and say we're here and so many miles and all that, you see. So we'd laid the map out, you see, and we realised we're coming fairly close to the Chindwin, but what we had to be careful was that the army were still, as we used to say, blowing a hole for us. And there was, there was no, no good in us going racing on. Suddenly we were surrounded by the Japanese and we were captured, you see, we were blown to bits. So we made sure that we still had a fairly open road where we were going. The army were still doing well and they were really shifting the Japanese. So what happened then was this. The station commander said, right, we take all the, 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 all the doors off all the vehicles. If they've got a sliding roof, you undo the locks and take the sliding roof on. And we have one truck at the back known as the GP wagon. That's the general purpose vehicle. All the doors, everything you can take off to open the vehicles up, go into the GP wagon. And it goes across the river last. Now, there's a reason for that. In previous a, a drills on river crossings, some of our vehicles were hit and they had the doors shut and the windows up and they were trapped, they got drowned, you see. So you've got a chance at least if you're hit and the thing goes over, you can out. And with the big crossways, the windscreens couldn't be taken off, but you could unscrew them. They had two separate windscreens in a middle bit. You could open both right up like that. So we opened them right up like that, you see, and we were ready. So we came down to this last bit and it was like a cutting and I can only assume it was a, a crossing which the Burmese had used for ferrying, probably for, you know, for small business and things like that, you know, uh, maybe a, a local village something doing some sales with things and a market, you see, because it, it looks as if it had been there a long time. But anyway, it was a cutting and we came right down to the edge of the river with our um, convoy of vehicles, you see. And they had two great big uh, American landing craft, they had massive things, you see, and uh, believe it or not, there was an army captain, the beachmaster, you know, with the ping pong badge, you know, as one we see in an aircraft carrier, and he's shouting at us all, you know, go on, it's not Christmas, it's not a Sunday school trip, get out, and he's going, and he's standing with his back to the Japanese across, and he's going like this, you see, and shouting and screaming at us, and we're all trying to manipulate and maneuver our vehicles in, you see, to position. Well, what actually happened was this. The CEO said to me, he said, I'm going to go in the Jeep, and drive it on to the first vehicle that's going to make the first crossing. But he said, you're going to go on the next vehicle with your driver because he says, we are both competent swimmers. Any of the fellows that are non-swimmers are not so good, we'll, we'll get them over last. And I was, if we get into trouble, we'll know it'll just stop the, the crossing. But we were told to set our watches and there was no turning back. When we reached the halfway point, that was the point of no return. No matter what happened, you just kept steaming on. Well, they started up the engines uh, two big engines on this landing craft. And I remember Jack Mole, the CEO, he ran his Jeep on, but I should tell you a little story about it before he, he, he ran his vehicle on. When we were looking at the maps further back, a Burmese came out of nowhere, and he had this chicken on a string, you see. It was more like, more like a parrot, you see. And he says to the CEO, typical of them, you know, they, they, they didn't usually say cigarette, they used to say cigarette. He says, Sam, you give me two cigarettes, I give you a live chicken, good for your dinner. You know, the old things, you know, say, I get lost, you see, he didn't want him to know. But this guy wouldn't go away, so the seal gives him two cigarettes, you see, gets the string. Well, he, he had the jeep, but the hood was down, so he ties the string on the jeep, and this little thing just sat there, quite the thing, not bothering anyone, you see. So, as we made the crossing, the vehicle is running, the jeep is running on, and this little thing is just sitting there like a canary or something, you see, not bothering, you see. Well, the next minute, we didn't know this. Our artillery were up in the two high pieces of ground. They started to fire straight across the river. Now, the river was just a little over a mile wide. That gives you an idea of the size, because big steamers could go up there. They were firing straight across the river, almost an open sight, blowing a hole for us on the other side. You could see trees going away and stuff. Horror and noise, and the smell of cordite was awful. And, of course, it's a warm day, and all this shelling, and it's very low, you see. Not, not way up like this, you see. So, um... The CEO put his jeep on as far forward near the front where the chains are. And I remember just get it climbing on to the, the vehicle because there was no door. I was pulling myself up and one of the, 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 the men shouted to me. He said, good luck. And I said, hey. and just as I was pulling myself in, another one said, and I remember what he said. He said, I'll see you on the other side. And I thought to myself, I'll maybe not get to the other side. Because we knew if anything went wrong, that was it, you see. So away we go. And... The Japanese, 
typical, you see. They couldn't, they were trying to stop us, they were trying everything. But the army had created two sort of small diversionary tactics further up the river, and they didn't know which way to turn. And you know what they were doing? They were throwing in great big empty packing boxes, engine boxes, all bigger than this desk, massive things with big Japanese markings, and they were backing into the side. There were dozens of them coming in, and men were shoving them away to keep the, the, um, the vessel heading for the right, the right mm. point. But I always remember, as we got a fairly well over, my driver had never said a word, he was very quiet, but I noticed he had a rifle stuck and a rack between it, and he kept looking at it occasionally, so I realised he was concerned, had he loaded it, so I put, took the rifle down and I checked it and it made sure it had a magazine in it and put one up the spout and let the safety catch up, and I put it back and he just went like that, he never spoke, you see. Well, uh, as time was getting on, I said, what happens now if a shell drops low on us, because we're nearly up, up the, the beach, you see, we're, we've had it, you see. Mm -hmm. The army were very good. They started to range a bit, fire for. They realised we were getting well over, you see. Well, the CEO turned round to me and he, he put his finger, I knew who that was, he was going to start the engine of his jeep. He was an American Willis jeep. He fires it up and he, I could hear him revving going, vroom, like, he just make sure it was all right, you see. The next one, the signal came, the front's going down, this is it, we're making the final run in, you see. Well, I don't know whether it was excitement with Jack Mole or he made a miscalculation, but we were in deeper water than he thought you see, and he zooms off this thing, and the next minute I couldn't see the jeep, strangely enough we didn't go over him, it suddenly went to the side, and there it was underwater, and he swam for it, and this chicken and this thing's going, oh, walking, and it's going round and round, you see, and I said, my goodness, we're in a war, and then this chicken, you see, well, what do we do? So, we managed to run right up, and we sort of hit our vehicle in a the side of the trees in the jungle, you see, it took a chance because we'd see other vehicles coming across and we couldn't leave it near the, the front bit because we'd block everyone. So we waited until another vehicle got across from my unit from 885 and we said, right, there's only one hope, we can't leave that jeep there. This, all the serious possessions are in there, everything he possessed and he's, he's chicken, you see. So we got, we got down, we got into the water, the ones who could swim, and we got a big tow hook and a chain, put it on the front hook of the Willis jeep and said, right, and this vehicle, which was the second one over, the, the driver just eased it back slowly and we pulled, luckily the, the, the Willis Jeep had landed on its wheels, not over on its side, because it was reasonably shallow, but I mean it was covering it, and we just pulled it out slowly. Well, of course we couldn't start it, you see, because the whole thing was soaked. So as we moved away, once all the vehicles got across, and we were very lucky, we got across, the next thing we had to do was to tow it. We towed it for five hours, and believe it or not, one of the motor mechanics we had, we had usually one or two MT uh, mechanics who looked after our vehicles, he said, I'm going to try and start it. He got it started, and do you know, when the, the, the war was coming to an end, we drove into the capture of the Rangoon, and my CEO was driving that old Jeep, and it had been underwater. But he did say to me that night, he says, oh, I had a nice chicken last night, the meal was good. So he ate his chicken, you see, and the string, you see. So we had things, things like, like this, you see. I mean, uh, uh, things which I, I can see vividly in my mind yet, even though they happened a long time ago. So as time was getting on, I'm always looking for the great chance, you know, more gear, you know, can I get something else? And here I see lying over on this road where we stopped, a beautiful American, I think it was a Thunderbolt aircraft lying. It, it, it crash landed with the undercart down, maybe shot off, but it was immaculate. But it was over a piece of open ground and this fellow said to me, you're not going to go over there are you? He says, why do you want to go? I said, I'm going to look and see if I can get anything from my jump box, you see. Yeah. He says, oh, you get picked off with a, a sniper. I said, I'm going to risk it. So when I moved from the edge of the road, like the convoy of the ship, I didn't go that way. I was going, whew, whew, like that, you see. I got and I jumped inside it. And there lying in the front, and the, right in the middle of the dashboard, was a beautiful American Western a, a meter. I think it was zero to 25 volts for the, the battery voltage, a lovely meter. I said, that'll be a milliamper, I can recalibrate that. So I had one, some tools, screwed it off, and away I went. And the same on the way back, I went, and they're all going, oh, you know, what, what, I'll just get dropped, you see. So I got back, and this was more for my junk box. So I was always up to all the tricks. Anything I could scrounge, I was after it, you see. And, of course, I kept building up odd bits. But there were a lot of things I had difficulty in getting, I must admit. Anyway, as time uh, progressed, we got on uh, the road to this place called Mictilla, and it was quite a road, I, I must admit. And we had to be very careful because the Japanese had uh, obviously left stragglers behind delivery, you know, suicide men, you know, they didn't give a hang. They were just going to lose their lives, and they would pick you off, you see. And the, a lot of them, the snipers were uh, good. Uh, the average Japanese soldier was not good with a rifle. I don't know whether it's his eyes or what. Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't awfully good. I mean, as far as taking aim was concerned. But the snipers they had were different. They had usually good guns with good sights. And they could take a bead on you. And you had to be very careful because they were doing a very crafty thing. As you moved through various places where there had been a lot of fighting, 
you'd see a, a Japanese um, sniper hanging up a tree with a big belt like this, see, feigning death. And when you went past him, he just shot you in the back. So when you went past, you didn't give him a second chance. You just lifted him with the stem gun, blew the tape, everything to bits, and he just fell on the ground. You stole his weapon through his pocket and says, cheerio, and moved on. Because if you didn't, you had one in the back. So this was a trick we had to get to <coughs> You had to play it safe because they were very crafty. And the Japanese knew that they'd had it anyway. They were prepared to sacrifice their lives anyway. But this is the th some of the things we had to do. We had to just play it, play it safe. So we duly move on, but we were held up because there was a tremendous battle raging at McTilla. Now I should tell you about McTilla. One of the Japanese generals said after the war, he survived the war, and he was in command of part of the, the Japanese army at Mutilla. They had about five airstrips all around there. And this fellow knew when the 14th Army were coming, and the Japanese were not containing them. In other words, we were gradually taking back more and more of Burma. The problem was, for the Japanese, if they lost the airfields, they were in big trouble. And this Japanese general admitted after the war, he said he had told one of his uh, junior officers on the quiet, he said he didn't tell the troops. He said, if we lose the main airfield at McTilla, we have lost the war in Burma. We are finished. Well, that's what the 14th Army were after. They were after this big airfield and some of the smaller ones, you see. So we were held up while this battle was going on. And I mean, it was a terrible battle. I mean, the, the Japanese casualties were just unbelievable. So we eventually moved in there, and there was dead everywhere. I mean, it was almost, it was like a meat market. It was just an awful uh, uh, situation. Well, our cook, a fellow called Tiny Stevenson, he had been a, a, a cook for 12 years in the merchant service. And I'll say this in Tiny's favour. If you gave him any food, he never wasted it. They used to say in the RAF, the food was good until the cook got it. You know, <laughs> but he wasn't like that. He never wasted it. He always got a nice meal when we had food, you see. And, of course, I should also tell you, quite often, they, when we were on the move, we were running very short of food, and we used to get airdrops, you see, and they, they, you'd see big shoots coming down eh, for us. They, they'd have stripes on them, a... Eh, uh, uh, a, a big shoot with a red stripe and a white stripe, that would probably be medical supplies. One with a green stripe would be ammunition. And we were so short of water sometimes because the, ar the, the army uh, were finding in front of us that the deep wells, the Japanese were putting arsenic down the wells and doing things like this, and so we couldn't drink it. It was unfit for human consumption. So we're getting drops by, by air, you see. So as we're going on, uh, we had to say, well, what do we, we, we do now? We've got enough food and this and that, you see. So um, as time went on, we moved into the outskirts of um, uh, McTilla and the Japs had even been caught there because they had put guards and people in foxholes and they were still lying there and I got the impression, I mean this is, uh, I've got to be honest here, this is probably a form, it's affecting your advanced nerves, you know, you're trigger happy, you know, you hear a sound at night, you're out, you're gun ready, you know, you'll just blast someone, you could kill someone, your own people, you see, you have to be very careful. Well, when we got near there, they were still lying in foxholes. Some of them were stretched out. Their glasses had just fallen down in their nose. One fellow still had his mess in and he had rice in it. And our fighters had riddled a lot of them, killed them all. And they were just lying there. I thought they were asleep. And you get the impression they're looking at you, you know. This is a strange thing. It's your nerves, you see. So as we moved on, the cook said, we've not had anything to eat for a long time. So the seer says, well, we'll have a brew up, you see. We'll have something to eat, you see. So we're all under tin plates, you see. And we're sitting. And we look. But the place we're going to have a brew up in, we're surrounded by dead Japanese. So I said, well, there's no other place. They're just everywhere. So we'll sit down here, you see. Well, I used to try and turn my back when I was eating away from them, you see. Well, we had a fellow on the unit. I'll never forget this fellow. There is the odd hard case, and we had one. But we only kept him for one thing on the unit. He had been born in a fairground. He was a showman's son in Brighton. And he could pack a truck to a nicety. You know, it was balanced everything. We always kept this fellow. But, oh, it was a hard case. Well, he's sitting with his plate, you see, and there's a Japanese dead with his arm out like this, you see. And he's talking to him, he's calling him Johnny. He says, how are you getting on, Johnny? He's going, he's going oh, well, I don't like this lot, you see. Well, he finishes his plate and he's licking his lips and cleaning his plate, you see. And as we're getting up to go away, he puts his hand out. He says, I'll see you later, Johnny. Cheerio, all the best. And we're going, oh, let's get out of here. This is the character you have. But again, this kept a lot of us going, you know, it made, it made things a bit different, you see. So we had to face up to things like this. There was always, as I say, one hard case somewhere. So we proceed and we're into McTilla. Well, we got down onto the lake at McTilla and we set all our equipment up there. We were there for quite a, some time. There was one very unfortunate thing there. But this time we had a little unit of RAF regiment assigned. 
to our particular unit and they were to try and defend us. They had, you know, like brain guns and all the usual things and they came with us. And that day, uh, in the fighting down, and the other side of the lake, the, 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 the uh, senior officer was killed, the wing commander. I always remember he was named Wing Commander Smith. He had been a regular before the war and he was killed in, in the battle there that, that day. It was sad. They were in an awful state because he was an awfully nice man, you know, but he lost his life in, in the battle. So there were, there were sort of sad moments uh, like this. So after we had been at Mictilla for a fair time, we had to move on. Again, I'm still scouting around for bits, but I admit there was nothing really uh, I could get at Brentilla in the way of radio parts for my junk box. The only thing I do remember, uh, there was a West African uh, unit there, great big fine looking men, you know, and they were running great big caterpillar tractor things in and digging big pits. They were burying Japanese 2000 at a time. It was a slaughter. They wouldn't give up, you see, and of course we just says, well, we're not going to die, the army's going to give them it, and that's what it was. They just murdered them, and that's what they're doing to get rid of them, because when bodies are lying there, they get very bloated, and the smell is uncommon. And if you uh, touch the body, they burst, they go, pew! And, I mean, it's just unbearable, you know. So the idea is to get them under the ground. They tried to burn them, first of all, that wasn't successful. They put lime on them, and the end is said, bury them. And the, the big uh, West African fellas, this was their terrible task. They got the job to do this. So we moved away from McTilla, and we said, now, where are we going now? Well, I, again, I, I think my next stop, remember, because I've got to look at the odd notes when it was a, uh, I think it was a, uh, uh, we're due to go to a place called Tongu. That was well done. By, by this time, by the way, a big part of Burma was already in Allied hands. We were really starting to move um, the, the Japanese. But I've got to be fair, they would not give up. They just kept going, you see, and struggling on. So we got to um, Tongu, and Tongu had two airfields. They had the main airfield at Tongu, which was what they call an all-weather strip. That means aircraft can land during the monsoon or the dry weather. But the, the airfield we were told to go to was disused. It was just a fair weather strip. could only be used in the good weather. So we hid all our equipment away on the edge of the jungle and we set up in a paddy field and got things uh, running. Well, this was quite an interesting place because I thought there's been a bit of fighting. I'll maybe find the odd thing here. Here I looked over and on the edge of this strip there was the shell, the remains of an old Dakota. But there was nothing in it when I got over it. There was no door on it. And I looked about and been stripped where the engines were out. I presume the RAF had taken everything away they could use and that was it and left the shell. But when I looked inside, right in front of me there's a, a, an aluminium box about this size, like that, with a lid on it and about so deep. But it had never been used for it, so I just unscrewed the screws and it was a brand new box. It must have been fitted by the, the makers uh, in California when the aircraft was built for something and they had never used it and they just left it on. So I unscrewed it and put the lid on and I said, if I turn the... Um, the panel that way, I can use it as a chassis and a panel for a radio, you see. So I put this in my junk box, you see. But I looked up and oh, there were two beautiful uh, ceramic insulators on the antenna, you see. It went along from the tail down into the things there. How will I get there? So I got a hacksaw and cutter. Oh, I thought, dead easy. I was still cutting there for about an hour. It was some fancy sort of stainless steel stuff uh, and it, it, it wasn't smooth. All, I mean, it, it was clever the way they had made it up. I was sawing and cutting. In the end, I got it done, but I didn't want the wire. I just it was after the insulator, so I got them, you see, because we had plenty of a, a, a 12 gauge a copper wire for our feeder run, so mm. I mean, I had no, no problem there. So this was a little extra thing I, I got. Well, there was one quite funny thing that happened at Tongu, and I shall never forget. This was the odd thing which I suppose kept a lot of us going. We had been told that. Where we were, it was reasonably safe, you see, there was no, no great problems. But there was always Japanese units being cut off, and they were probably starving, short of food, short of ammunition, and they would break out, and they'd go for small units, and they would attack you to get whatever they could, you see. Well, some of the lads on the unit had decided, and probably quite uh, wisely at the time, never thinking, to dig a few foxholes, you see. They were digging foxholes, you see, and everything was going well. Here this night, RAF intelligence sent word down the road from the army, Every man take cover. There's a ground attack up the road. There's Japanese coming down where we were on the edge of this old, old airfield. So when you get the word, every man for himself, you take that into a foxhole. So we're all in the foxhole, you see. And when the, the shooting nonsense started, there were eight foxholes in a rough line, you see. Jack Mole, my CEO, was here. I was here. And the rest of them were radar operators who had managed to get into it and the other folks, you see. So it was the odd tree disappearing and the noise. And when the Japanese come at you, they don't come on their bare feet. They beat tambourines, bugles, blow and make a terrible noise to try and destroy you, to frighten you, you see. And this is what they do. And of course, things were getting pretty dicey. And then a little radar operator sitting, uh, uh, lying uh, down like this, you see, keeping the head down in the end foxhole. And things were getting worse and worse for him, you see. 
And he made the most terrible mistake, but he got away with it. He stood up like this, and he put his hands up like this. And I shall not use the language he used, but he shouted out for everyone to hear, including the Japanese, Where are the so-and-so's Errol Flynn now? <laughs> <laughs> and we're all going, what the heck? <coughs> <clears throat> well, we spoke to him after it was all over, and one guy said, get your head down, he was a veteran to him, and he should have known. If he'd only been out in the forest about five minutes, he said, well, he doesn't know any better. We'd been there a long time. So we spoke to him afterwards about this. What made you do that? Oh, I said, I was fed up, you see. Fed up. <laughs> well, one of the boys said to him, about two days later, where have you been? He said, I've not been anywhere. He says, you've been away somewhere, we've been trying to find you. He says, why have you been trying to find me? He says, there's a long-distance telephone call coming in from you for America. We can't locate you. We've been trying to find you. And they're all keeping a straight face. And he says, who was it? And the, the, fellows, the radar rocket is standing there, and some of the, the chaps, I mean, how they were doing this, I don't know. They're saying, do you know his name? Ah, uh, it was Eric something. And they're all doing this. What do you think it was? And they're all guessing, you see, enlarging on the thing. And one fellow says, I've got it. He says, his name was Errol, but we don't know his second name. And one wee stroll out of nowhere says, I think I know... Flanders. No, Flint. Eh, no, no. Flynn. Oh, that's it. We've got it. It's, that's the fella. He's to phone him. Well, two days later they say, have you phoned him? Oh, yes. This is not a bad chap. He says, the two of us are planning this campaign. We're going to do it this time. Don't you worry. Well, every day, how's it going? Been phoning Errol. And this, they kept this going. And my commanding officer turned and said to me, <coughs> he says, do you know? He says, that kept a lot of them sane that time, you know, this carry on, you know, they're, they're forgetting about the war, which is a good thing to the mind of it, you see. And for a long time, they kept doing this. And of course, we had no telephones, you see, we had nothing. The only other thing we had to be very careful with uh, was this. When uh, we were uh, in, in radio communication with the outside world, which was our uh, wing headquarters, they were usually always about 40 miles down in a safe area, you see. And we were in touch with by by radio all the time with them, you see. And of course, the messages were in code, you see. Now, we didn't have a very uh, elaborate system of coding and decoding. But we had one little uh, box, an American uh, unit. It was about the size of a small field telephone. It was in a, a very nice olive green uh, metal cabinet with a plate on the usual thing, you know, U.S. Army Signal Corps, and a clasp and a lid and a lovely strap, and you could carry it. Well. When one opened the, the lid of this little uh, machine, it had two um, spools on it with a paper tape, similar to the type of tape one found in the old telegram. Remember, we used to see a telegram, and it says, you know, best wishes on your birthday or something, you know, uncle or John or something, like that, and, the, and a little keyboard. Now, when the wireless operator received the message, he had it on a, an RAF signals pad. At the top corner, on the left-hand side, there was a space for what they called the preamble. It usually was a, a five-letter... Um, or a five number a wording. And as long as the preamble was right, they'd got the rest of the message. You set up the preamble first, you see, on it, and then you started knocking out the cards, and the message came out on the tape in plain language. But there was a problem. We discovered through RAF intelligence that the Japanese were breaking this code down we were using on this system, because it wasn't a very complicated thing, in about six hours. So you had to be on your way before six hours, because they could maybe trace you, so you know there was something uh, uh, adrift. And apparently this thing was designed <coughs> by, um, it was called a Haglan. It was designed by a Swiss engineer who went to America uh, before the war and settled, and he designed it for them. He was an engineer doing things such as this. So I, I believe it was really of Swiss origin, much as it was uh, manufactured in America. So that was the one thing. A wireless operator would sometimes come with another signal, and he would put it down, and uh, you'd say how much time we, we'd got. They'd look at his watch. He says, we've only got three quarters of an hour left. Let's get the heck out of here as quickly as we can. We had to, you see, because we could possibly be traced. So we're using this little thing uh, to, to keep in touch. That was the only sort of coded message we had in and out. We had nothing more uh, sophisticated than that. So as I say, we had to be very, very careful. So while we were at a, a Tongu, um, we had one or, one or two slight hiccups there. One uh, was... An army unit appeared, oh, maybe about 100 yards away from where our convoy was, you see. And this uh, army captain, he should really have come over and, and, and said to us, first of all, he was going to open fire. Because there was a mountain range not so very far away called the Pegu Yomas. And a number of Japanese were still hiding up there. They hadn't got them uh, rooted out, you see. And uh, this fellow was ordered to fire on their positions, you see. And every time he fired, the two traces in our equipment just, whoo, this, you see, we couldn't plot, do anything, you see. So we had to go and tell him. Oh, he said, I'll give you the wire when I'm going to do this, and you can have a break, and you'll have a rest. No, that was it. Well, we did, what we didn't know was, 
They had a fellow away in the distance there in the long grass, and he had an American walkie-talkie. He was an advanced spotter, and he was actually watching this Japanese unit, you see, and directing the fire. And this day, it was the last day they were firing, apparently he was watching them, and they were all lining up at their cookhouse, you see, for their grub, you see, and they're in a line. And he gives this a, a signal to the, the gunner's back on his walkie-talkie. Just lift the range at so many yards, you see. The first shot missed them. The second shot landed right in the middle of them, blew everything to bits. So they didn't have to go up there and look for them. They'd killed them all. That was it. So there were things like this going on. And of course, if you got people who could use a gun and knew what they were doing, it was very, very positive. And of course, it saved a lot of our men having to charge up and maybe lose their lives, you see. So a lot of them held out in the Peggy Yomas to quite near the end of the war. But anyway... As I say, we were at Itongu, and of course we had to look again and see where we were going. So we got a wind that probably our next move would be down the road with the army, and we were going to try and capture Rangoon. Well, of course, the problem was the prisoners on the Siam Railway were dying by the hundred every week. It was really terrible. But we had agents there on the edge of the railway with radio, they were part of the Force 136, that's part of SOE. They were sending back signals of traffic to the RAF and to the Army saying, come as quickly as you possibly can because the death rate on the railway is very, very high. We'll save as many as we can if we get into Rangoon quickly and capture the city. So Montbatten, who was our commander, Lord Lee Mont he used to come around the forward units and speak to us, you know, trying to sort of cheer us on a bit. He would say, I know you're tired and you've come a long way, but he said, I'm asking you for a maximum effort because of the conditions, you see, which uh, are prevailing on the railway. So it did make a lot of us go. So uh, we got um, uh, packed up at uh, Tongu and we started to head uh, down the road. And the first place we came to, it was really getting dark, was a place um, called uh, Pegu. And I was so tired, we just lined the vehicles up in this street, in this little township, and I just slept on the pavement. We just lay down. We were exhausted. We were shot dead. We were just hanging there. We got up in the morning and away we went. So as we started to move down the last part of the road, getting near um, to Rangoon, we knew if we could keep moving with the army, the Japanese were going to have a hard time to stop us because by this time the army was just steamrolling the Japanese. They were just throwing everything at them. And I've got to be fair again, the Japanese certainly put up with it in a very, very a fine way. They were good soldiers and they certainly would not give in. I mean, they fought to the very end. I mean, I would give them credit eh, for that, for all the terrible things they had done. They were very, very good soldiers. So as we got down near to um, Rangoon after having left <coughs> um, uh, uh, Pegu, uh, I remember... We were coming down from a high road, and I, I remember looking, and I thought I could see the city, and I lifted my binoculars and I looked, and there was big buildings. I hadn't seen this for a long time. It was like manna from heaven. I couldn't believe it. I said, it's there, the prize we can go. And the 